Yeah, my name is Dara Coop, and I'm the chair of the Quebec branch of CGIC. And so it's my privilege to introduce Jane Shapiro, the Senior Vice President uh, and National Crisis Communication Lead of Hill and Knowlton Strategies Canada. Jane has more than 30 years of experience in corporate consulting and government environments. She works on complex client matters to gain community and stakeholder acceptance and enhance, preserve or minimize damage to corporate reputation. Jake works with executive teams and corporate boards in both the public and private sectors, providing counsel and support on difficult and often urgent situations, which have included governance issues, executive terminations, investigations, cybersecurity attacks, legal actions, restructuring, environmental incidents, and public engagement in political and community in sensitive environments. She develops crisis communication plans and delivers simulation exercises designed to prepare or organizations to manage these urgent situations effectively. Prior to joining Hill and Knowlton, Jane worked at another global agency in public affairs with multinational corporations in the oil and gas and pharmacal industries and in both government and political offices. So she has great experience in both the public and private domain. I'm going to turn it over to Jane. I'm looking forward to this. She's going to outline her approach. And she has uh, told us she would really like this session to be interactive. So hopefully you've all come with questions and situations to ask about. Jane, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, uh, Dora. I am, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I, I've already learned a lesson, which is I, I, I need to really shorten my bio. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to work on that. So I'm delighted to be here today with you. Uh, I think this topic of crisis management and, and uh, corporate governance um, is couldn't be more timely. Uh, and so uh, we know from incidents that we're seeing uh, in this country and, and elsewhere, uh, just how important it is um, and the role of boards um, in terms of managing urgent situations, but also the impact of urgent situations on boards, both uh, collectively and on individual directors also. So um, before I get into the meat of the matter, I want to make two points, one of which, um, thank you very much for uh, mentioning it already. I'd be really delighted um, I think the, the, uh, the session will be all the more better um, for your uh, participation and interaction. So if at any point in my remarks, you have uh, a question or an observation from your own experience um, that you wanna ask or share, uh, please turn on your mic, turn on your camera um, and, uh, and we'll, have a, we'll have a conversation. I think that's much more entertaining than listening to me. And one way or the other, there will be a Q and A session, uh, a Q and A opportunity at the end. The second, uh, thing I want to mention is that for those of you who are thinking that this is a good opportunity to get lunch or to catch up on email and that you can, after the fact, um, you know, peruse the deck um, that will accompany these remarks, I, I want to tell you that I, I believe I'm breaking new ground here um, in that um, there is no deck. So exciting. There is one slide, however, and I think you can see it now. Yes, you can see the, the slide, which is the agenda essentially for these remarks. Start with a definition, which I think is a good place to start in any conversation about uh, crisis management. Um, Want to speak a little bit about how reputation is at the center of all of it. Uh, why boards are particularly, and I, I'm seeing this increase in interest, um, preoccupied and seized with crisis preparedness, what a board protocol looks like. Uh, I wanna just touch briefly, because it's a subject I find fascinating, on the really different relationships boards have with founder or family CEOs versus what I will call for hire CEOs um, and what challenges that presents to boards. Uh, and finally, just to, uh, to end with some 
um, brief remarks about the core elements of good crisis management planning. And then of course, as I mentioned, leave, leave time for both questions and comments because I'm sure all of you have had experiences that will be uh, useful and relevant for, for others. I do think it's useful to, to start with a short definition of what is a crisis because people view this very differently. Uh, and in the course of the work that I do, and I would add that the work that I do is very much two parts, crisis response, people in urgent situations, and crisis preparedness. And year over year, we're seeing more work in, the, in crisis preparedness. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that in, in a moment, but I, which I, I find a really uh, positive and interesting trend. But in my work in crisis preparedness, I see a lot of plans. Um, and companies often come to me, organizations, and say, take a look at what we've got, and then tell us, give us recommendations on what we should be doing. On the other hand, there are many who don't have anything at all, particularly from a communications point of view, as opposed to business continuity plans or operational plans. And what I see when I review plans, which I also think should incorporate a definition of how do you know whether this is a crisis or not, I see often very complex multifactorial uh, criteria that include things like size of the problem, particularly if it's, a, if it's um, uh, not a service, but a, um, uh, you know, a business that offers products. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes that's based on financial thresholds and so on. So I, find, I think that the whole assessment, which should be rapid, becomes, can become bogged down and complicated when you have too uh, complex or too many criteria. I also think sometimes it misses the mark entirely because while the impact on the business from an operational or sales point of view may be quite low, the impact from a reputational point of view may be very high. And if you're not factoring that into your equation as well, then you've really missed the opportunity to address the situation on an urgent basis. I tend to use, I do use a much briefer uh, definition uh, that's easier to make an assessment on, that's first and foremost, are you putting people's uh, wellness and safety at risk? Is there a risk to people? To me, that's a, you know, uh, that, that hits the mark of this may well be a crisis and we should consider it one. Second, is there a uh, disruption to business as usual? Has it been disrupted and for a prolonged, will it be, and for a prolonged period of time? And the, the duration there is important. I think we can all, most of us, whether a, uh, a, bus a disruption that is short-lived. The question then is, how long is prolonged? And that's going to differ for, different, for companies in different situations. If, for instance, you're in the business of transporting live animals, um, or fresh produce, uh, your, your, what you can tolerate in terms of a disruption uh, is going to be very different from someone who has, uh, for instance, is delivering professional services or um, you know, hard goods. So I think you know, those are things that companies need to consider, but number one is, are you putting people at risk? Number two, is your ability to do business as usual disrupted for a define what it means to you, prolonged period of time. Uh, and thirdly, is there a risk, a real risk to reputation? Now, of course, the first two things may, may bring on a significant risk to reputation, but there are other things as well. And those would be, for instance, workplace harassment issues or fraud uh, or misconduct by uh, your CEO or perhaps your CFO, but certainly executive management, which may not impact operations at all, but certainly will have an impact on reputation. Finally, in assessing whether you have an urgent situation or not and how to manage it, it's important to make a distinction between whether it is something that is happening to you alone, and so you're the center of much media and other attention, or is it happening to the whole community? Like for instance, a global pandemic, where 
which of course is a crisis, where uh, uh, you may not then be the center of media attention, but it is important always to remember that you remain the center of the universe to your key stakeholders, those stakeholders being your employees, your shareholders potentially, your customers and others, and never forgetting how important they are in terms of uh, uh, you know, assessing the degree of, of risk and the de degree of reputational risk to, uh, of, of a crisis um, to the organization. So, um, sorry. Uh, so as we've seen then, reputation is critically important. Um, and the question is, why? Why is it that important? And I think we've seen increasingly, you've all seen, how when things start to go wrong, and we see this most particularly with celebrities of all kinds, uh, partners, investors, shareholders, others will move very rapidly um, to put distance between themselves and what they consider to be a bad or unethical actor. Uh, and that happens almost instantaneously. And, and it happens because these organizations want to protect themselves. They don't want to be um, you know, associated or tainted um, with, uh, you know, with scandal or with, with, uh, with problematic behavior by association. So they will separate themselves rapidly uh, in the face of, of, of allegations and will in fact rush to be first movers because they also want to assert their own ethical principles. So they're, they're interested in being the first, you know, the first out the door, the first mover advantage goes to, um, and others will follow suit. It sets a standard for them. So you can see that, and what is interesting, I think what's noteworthy is that once companies uh, disassociate themselves with from, from organizations or from particular brands, uh, that regardless of the outcome, so even if the allegations prove not to be true, uh, if lawsuits are actually not pursued, uh, if the facts demonstrate otherwise over long term, once those, those, uh, that separation has been made, that disengagement with the brand, it doesn't come back. So these impacts on reputation endure. So, um, uh, you know, these things are, I think, are very important when considering what you need to do. And I think a quick aside about this, and this is where I, I feel strongly, and most of, much of the work I do is with lawyers, um, that there is this good, really interesting complementarity between communication strategies and legal strategies. So communications tends to come in at the very beginning because you really need to be establishing your narrative. And I'll say a little more about that to come. Legal strategy, so communication strategy is both immediate and ongoing. Legal strategy tends to be a long game, may not, may take months, even years to actually come to a, um, uh, to, you know, to, a, to, a, to its most important moments. And I think there are many occasions where you can see that what the company does both operationally and from a communications point of view can have a positive impact on the legal strategy um, as you, you know, as the, uh, as the situation unfolds and it has a positive impact on what comes later. Um, Jane, did you see? Yeah. Yeah. Janice? Yes. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yes, you raised something really interesting, the concept of a legal strategy, which is finding out what happened and whose fault is it. It takes a long time. Um, but you, you, you bring up the, the issue of the definitional issue of crisis as being really bounded in reputation. And I like the idea that when we talk about reputation and whether there's reputational risk, um, it's when you talk about m focusing right in on our key stakeholders. So like a COVID crisis is going to be a, a reputational challenge for, um, for everybody. Um, I guess my question to you though, Jane, is 
How do you deal with the fact that in our world right now, and maybe this is why you're so busy, uh, uh, the emergence and the power of social media and how word gets around, there are so many um, issues of perceived. So perceived fraud, perceived conflict of interest, perceived um, management uh, misbehavior. Um, and, you know, you fly to the lawyers and you wait and wait and wait and wait. Um, what should organ how quickly do organizations have to respond to that perceived issue? Yeah, so I, it, it's uh, thank you very much, um, Janice, for that question. Um, and it's I was going to get to that point um, uh, almost immediately. So it's a nice segue. Thank you very much. Um, I do think that that is one of the challenges, which is that and it's not new. Uh, speed in communications, speed, excuse me, in managing a crisis has always been important. Uh, and I, you know, I was about to quote, uh, and many of you will have seen it, it's been quoted many, many times, attributed to Warren Buffett, that US American icon, uh, that, you know, it takes years and years to develop a good reputation and minutes to, to destroy it. Um, and that's why companies really need to, need to be focused and understand those implications. And what I would say about that, you know, is that that was, he said that long before social media. And so what social media has done to that, you know, it's gonna take minutes. It doesn't take minutes anymore. When something goes wrong for an organization, the effect of social media is almost instantaneous. In fact, it is not infrequently the case that organizations find out that they've got a problem on social media. So it, it really, you know, it's impossible to say we're going to get in front of it. Your goal really is to try to stay even with it. And that's a big, that's a big try. That's not easy. And so I think, um, and I, it, because I work uh, virtually always with lawyers, I find that lawyers increasingly, not every one of them, but most increasingly understand that dynamic. Um, and the And the relationship is one that is, um, pretty um, smooth, uh, and generally we get to communicate quite quickly. And I think the caveat there that I find lawyers find reassuring, and I certainly believe in it, is that you never speculate about what you don't know. Never speculate about what you really hope is true, uh, about what you really, really wish happens. You only communicate about what you know is true. And that's important, and it's important for the organization to do it because you want to establish yourself on social platforms and on your website and everywhere else as the source of credible information. And to do that, you have to do it fast because once you let others establish a narrative, and as you said, you know, Janice, it's really important, that narrative may be uh, wildly incorrect, uh, and it may come from people who, you know, do have um, um, not good intentions uh, or who simply like to have, like to, you know, um, uh, give themselves a lot of profile. It's really important that you don't let that, those narratives become people's understanding of the situation. Because then you'll be chasing those, those narratives. Um, uh, you'll spend a huge amount of time and energy chasing those narratives that are being set by somebody else uh, instead of establishing your own. And that can be a very expensive from the point of view of reputation as well as cost, uh, uh, time consuming and ultra ultimately not all that successful endeavor. So the speed, the importance of speed, and I believe everybody in, um, you know, who's involved understands that is critical so that you can establish the facts yourself before others do it for you. I'm not sure if that was um, the answer, if that was the answer you were looking for, uh, but I hope that helps. Was there another question before I continue? Okay, thank you. So, I've, um, I, I'm gonna have to skip ahead since these were some of the things I was, I was a very timely intervention. So thank you very much. Um, so I think I've, you know, I've addressed the importance of, of, of social media and I think in boards increasingly 
uh, also you know, understand this. And so they are also um, advocates and champions of, uh, of quick communications. I think they also understand the liability issues that go with, um, you know, with issues, with crisis um, that are not resolved in a, in a timely and, and adequate way. Um, and that are, uh, and we and know that uh, that's the way that, uh, you know, that route lies uh, um, uh, with, there are lawsuits, class action lawsuits, um, and other risks that come along with not addressing some of these issues and letting um, the uh, alternative facts as, as they've come to be known, um, uh, gain some, gain some uh, ground. So I think that it's really noteworthy um, in this context that organizations are often uh, remembered more for how they manage situations, critical situations, than for those situations themselves. And I'm sure all of you can think of examples where the thing you remember most, perhaps the thing you remember most um, about the horrible environmental disaster in the Gulf of Mexico by BP a couple of years ago, um, is the performance of the CEO who did not survive long um, after his, uh, his role as spokesperson for, for the organization, which did a lot of reputational damage on top of the environmental catastrophe um, and, uh, and became you know, a very large source of media and other attention. Doesn't go well for the organization, um, and, but it does point out uh, uh, the importance. So given that awareness, it's important to look at what's the board's role? What's the board's responsibility um, in, uh, in these situations? And I wanna preface my answer by saying, I think that in crisis communications in particular and in crisis management, it's really important for all of the players to understand what and to understand what their lane is and to stay in it. Uh, so staying in your lane, what's that? What is that for the board? And I think for the board, it is in most cases, active oversight. It's active oversight of management, holding management to account, asking tough questions, uh, be making sure they're informed on a very regular basis and they can set the, uh, the cadence for that. But, and having said all that, very important for the board to let management manage. That is good governance. That's management's uh, responsibility and obligation. And what does that mean? Identifying the risks, developing mitigation strategies, implementing corrective actions, conducting internal and external communications. Those are management functions. Uh, and having said that, the board as well may, at the request of management, offer advice. And that is something many board members or some board members are well equipped to do because they're on the board due to their subject matter, because they're subject matter experts. They have a lot of experience or expertise in the industry um, and they have a lot of potentially uh, a lot to offer management, but it needs to be at management's request. It is not a board prerogative. So letting management manage is, is important. And I think um, that having said that, there are limited situations, and I'm sure you can all think of them, where in fact the board does have to take over, not active oversight, but active management of the organization. And in my mind, those are not many, and you may think of others, but here are the ones that I believe are, are, are um, uh, where the board needs to come in. One is where there are allegations of either illegal or unethical behavior by the CEO or perhaps the CFO, but more likely the CEO. When the CEO is not capable, perhaps due to illness or injury, um, is not, uh, does not have the, the capability uh, to continue to perform his, uh, his or her responsibilities. Uh, when the board has lost confidence in the executive management of the company for whatever reason, 
And lastly, uh, in the event of a hostile takeover bid uh, or uh, an, a very activist shareholder. And that last, that last situation, uh, a hostile takeover or an activist shareholder may put members of management uh, in a conflict situation. And it was normal then for the, the board to, uh, to step in in a more active way. When that happens, that may be that the board will set up a, an ad hoc or special committee to manage the situation reporting to the board, or it may be the board as a whole. That's really a decision for the board uh, to make. Um, in all cases, regardless of the situation, whether the board is actively managing or actively overseeing, at the end of an incident, of every incident, um, it is important, as many commentators have said, to never let uh, you know, a good crisis go wasted. So to learn the lessons from that crisis so that the next one is managed better. And that means that the board, like all other participants, should be actively involved in evaluating uh, what, uh, what happened, did it go well, what we, could we have done differently, what could we do better, uh, how do we improve for the next time, and, and, and providing that um, that analysis uh, and, and possibly recommendations uh, to management, which will be undertaking exactly the same kinds of, of uh, an analysis and assessment. So um, I think I want to talk briefly here a little about, and I mentioned this in my agenda, the relationship between um, boards um, and executive management. And I have had um, the opportunity over many years to help boards, both private and public, um, um, part company, part ways with CEOs for a whole variety of reasons, normally related to both uh, behavior or, or um, corporate performance. And I, one observation I have about that is that it generally takes a long time. It's not a quick decision. Now, the good part of that is just prudence. The board is really assessing the implications of the decision they, they may be making on key share stakeholders, whether those are employees or investors or, or, or customers or others. And that's a good thing. Um, it, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 light, a, decision, a decision taken lightly. But on the other hand, I think sometimes boards are delayed in their actions because actually the CEO, uh, normally a fellow board member, has become a friend over time. And it's just hard to make these decisions when it's not, when you have that added uh, factor of somebody who you come to like personally uh, may have become a friend um, and it's just harder to, it's harder to do. Thirdly, and the least good case uh, is when the board simply doesn't have enough information, has not been uh, executing its responsibility in terms of, uh, uh, thorough oversight and doesn't have the information it needs to make that decision. And so in some of those cases, I think it takes the board too long. And I believe that boards should be alert to these barriers to good governance and so that they're acting always in the interests of shareholders and other stakeholders. So this role, I think, and this is I, where I get to a, a bit of a discussion about um, founder CEOs versus what I call for higher CE, uh, uh, CEOs. It can be challenging for organization, for bo boards of directors in organizations where the CEO is the founder or members of the family. Um, and by way of example, and this is something that I've been looking at over oh, the last four or five years, I started to be really interested in it. Um, when Uber um, uh, had a CEO that was problematic and it wasn't the board, his board that dismissed him, rather, according to everything I have read, um, it was the uh, several of the, of the company private at the time, I believe, um, uh, of their largest institutional shareholders coming to the CEO and saying, we won't tolerate this, not the board, but the largest institutional shareholders who said, it's you or us, I believe, and he left. And so I find that interesting. I also noted uh, in, I guess it was 2018, uh, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, 
uh, use that, um, um, you know, the platform of choice now um, for CEOs, billionaires, and some presidents. I was going to say former presidents, but he doesn't have a Twitter account anymore. But the platform is an appealing platform now for everyone to make announcements of all kinds. Uh, and you may recall that Elon Musk at some point um, uh, mused on Twitter that he might take his company public, private, excuse me, private, uh, and at what price. And again, uh, in this case, it, it appeared, I'm not saying I know this, I do not, it appeared that his board of directors was as surprised as his shareholders and as, the, as surprised as his investors and, and analysts. Uh, and I think this can be problematic. And in fact, again, in this case, it was the Securities Exchange Commission that removed him as chairman of his company and required him to submit his public statements about the company uh, to lawyers for approval. So again, not the board being able to exercise authority over the CEO in those situations, but another organization. And so I think that that, that issue is really an important one. Uh, and of course, we've seen in Canada very recently, the Rogers um, uh, spectacle, uh, governance spectacle play out. Uh, and it's a different situation, of course, because of the company's structure, which allows the CEO who was then the former CEO and is now the CEO again, also having being the chair of the family trust to actually uh, replace his independent board directors with ones more to his liking. And I think that it, this is something that people who want to serve on boards really should be taking into careful consideration whether in fact they feel that they're going to be able to exercise proper governance um, in the organizations um, that they are about to become directors of. Uh, and something they should consider uh, both in terms of their governance um, uh, requirements, but also their personal reputations. So with that, uh, I want to close because I certainly want to make sure we're leaving lots of time for conversation. I want to close with you know, a few words on some of the core elements of crisis planning. Because we've talked a lot about how would they make a difference, how it makes a difference in terms of your ability to communicate quickly, but want to make sure that we also talk about what is it? What does that look like? And what it looks like is, first and foremost, understanding what are the scenarios that put your organization at risk? And most organizations can very quickly define what those things are particular to them. If you put you know, your executive team around a table for 20 minutes, you will likely come up with 98% of the, of the things that are likely to occur. And then once you have done that um, to uh, look at, so what are the contingency plans that would apply to those, uh, you know, in those situations? Um, and then planning around them, including understanding what your narrative is. The other piece of good crisis planning, of course, is having a process. And part of that process that you follow and that everybody's familiar with. And part of all of that, of course, is saying, Who's on this team? Who are the members of our crisis team? And equally important, because everyone wants to rush to help, who isn't? So who are the members of your crisis team? Do they understand what their role is on the team? Do they understand what their responsibilities are? How they work together? All of those things are gonna be critically important because if you've ever worked in a situation where it was urgent and nobody knew any of those things, there's a lot of people rushing around, as they say, as the expression goes, like chickens with no heads, um, and things get very chaotic, mistakes can get made, people can get left out, um, and the situation can have a less, um, uh, a less good um, uh, outcome than they would if you had a process, if you have a team, if you understand scenarios, if you've done some contingency planning around those scenarios, and you have a fulsome narrative. So it's really applying the same kind of rigor and discipline as you would to an operational event to a reputational event. 
uh, and being as, as, as disciplined about it. And finally, I think having done all of that, a plan is only as good as your ability to execute it. And so I think when, whenever people come to me and say, I'd like to do, we'd like to do a, uh, to have a crisis plan. Uh, and by the way, I said I would get back to this and I, I wanna put it in now. Um, when people come to me and say, we want a crisis communications plan, I, I say two things. One, why now? And the answer in, in almost invariably is our board of directors directed management to do it. We want that to do it. And that's because the board has recognized how important it is for all the reasons that I've already discussed. But I do find it interesting that how frequently it is a board directive to management. This is something we want you to do. They understand the liability issues for them. They understand the governance issues. And so I, I find that interesting and, and encouraging. Uh, the other thing I say to people who want crisis plans is, look, if you're not, if you don't want to practice this plan, if you don't want to do a crisis drill using this plan, I advise you not to create it. Save your money. Because if you don't practice, then you're not going to use that plan. You're not going to use that process in a real crisis because it's new and unfamiliar to you. So you'll go back to just, you know, stumbling along and hoping it works. So I think that the planning and the and the and the exercise really go together, and and I always encourage companies to do it, and I think they learned a lot from it. For me, a really encouraging development in the last year or year and a half or two years is that I've done crisis plans for two organizations, uh, one in the public, one publicly traded, a public company, and one not. Um, and in both cases, the boards have said. Well, if you're going to create a protocol for management, we want one too. So can you please create a protocol for the board step-by-step step in terms of what we do when we're presented either with a plan, either with a crisis that management is managing or one that where we have to take over active management. Um, and I've done that in now. And so two organizations have board protocols. Uh, and I think that's a terrific development. And in one case, uh, the board actually asked me to facilitate an exercise for them alone. So with no management present. Um, so I was able to give them a scenario involving the CEO and facilitate a, uh, you know, a couple of hours discussion among board members in terms of how, how they would manage that situation. So I, thought, I think these, that's a really encouraging governance development um, and I, I would be delighted if other boards uh, follow suit. I think it's in, it's in their best interest. So I think with that, uh, I will conclude and hope that uh, you have uh, questions or comments or observations uh, to share. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Um, very interesting. And um... While people are thinking of their questions, I'm going to take this opportunity because I've got the mic to ask. Uh, I sort of have two because you talked about risk planning to some degree. And um, I think many boards do that with management and contingency plans to some degree. But my question also is around the black swans, is, you know, like the big events that you don't see coming. And I think of these floods in Abbotsford. Um, and so the, the Fraser Valley where, you know, even though you aren't directly impacted by it, you're on that supply chain and how do you manage that and react? So then my second question is, um, again, you're building your crisis team internally. When do you have someone from the outside come in? And I, you know, that, that's sort of a question, how much do you rely on inside and when do you have somebody come in and help you work through it? So thank you for that. In answer to your first question, I think black swan events are few and far between. So I would say the Abbotsford floods are not a black swan event. Uh, extreme climate, uh, extreme weather events are now normal. We might not know exactly what they look like, but we know that they occur and we know that they're gonna to continue to occur with, great fre with greater frequency. And so I think as part of contingency planning, if you live near a lot of water, 
then you should be developing plans for that water to, you know, for that water to flood. Um, if you are, you know, you don't have to be, um, uh, you know, a, um, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to be a, a uh, what's the word, you know, a fortune teller to know that wildfires um, are going to be increasingly common because of drought conditions in parts of North America and elsewhere in the world. And um, we've seen them, we've seen them elsewhere in the world, devastating fires in Australia. But I think these things are predictable. And I think that they are things that companies ought to be preparing for, ought to be considering and developing contingency plans. Now, those plans may not be able to take into account, of course, they won't be able to, specific uh, you know, specific impacts. Will the water go up? How much? How far? For how long? But they know that these are these are things that will happen, that can happen and will happen. So I think that, you know, when companies do good contingency planning, these are things they're taking, they ought to be taking into account. So when I think of back, you know, in recent history, about things that I think of as black swan events, um, I don't, for instance, include that enormous blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, because I think that anyone who was drilling in water that deep, uh, any company drilling in water that deep that knew, for example, that if there was a blowout, they knew they didn't know how to cap it. And that became obvious, it took months for them to figure out how to cap it. So that was not a black swan event, although people have called it that. I can only think of a couple. And I will tell you that I think that Malaysian airliner that fell out of the sky apparently or disappeared entirely never to be seen or you know again or heard from in any way that to me is a black swan event i don't think that most airlines doing contingency planning and thinking about the scenarios that might impact them would say how about a plane that just disappears and is never heard from and never found that to me was you know beyond beyond what what um, uh, you know, an airline company would be expected to, uh, to plan for. Um, I also quite frankly think, although it's no longer the case, but at the time that the election of Donald Trump um, in 2016 was something mm -hmm. of a black swan event, because uh, I'm not quite sure that anybody anticipated that as a real possibility. Uh, and certainly it had not happened before. Uh, so I think, you know, that that may qualify as a black swan, but there aren't very many, in fact. Um, and I think that, you know, it behooves companies to really think broadly about the things that could happen to them, um, particularly in areas where we're already seeing, the, you know, these, these kinds of activities occur. We've seen extreme weather events for years now, and so it's something that every organization should have a plan around. Your second question, uh, which is when boards bring in someone else. Sorry, in... Jane, I guess the question on those black swans is not only you might be affected directly, but it's up the supply chain. So as somebody yeah. not near the water, if you've got a supplier near there, you've got to be thinking about that. So okay. no question, no question. Listen, as well, you also have to consider if most of your uh, goods are coming to you by train and truck across the continent, then that's, you know, now you have to, I think, consider that because we've seen several disruptions where, you know, not only in British Columbia, but definitely in British Columbia, where there has not been train traffic, there's, you know, trucks can't get through. Um, and I think we've all seen in the last year or two, so many supply chain disruptions, that supply chain disruptions beyond your ability to control is something organizations absolutely need to be looking at. So I, I, I take, I do take that point the black swan thing aside. Um, but those aren't black swan events either. Those are something now that companies should really be preparing for, even if it's not happening to them directly, but if it affects their supply chain, they need to be thinking about, about that possibility. So the other question you asked is about when you bring in experts. And I think that you should be bringing in experts early because in every situation, I can say that I think when I work, because I'm, I'm in communications, that I'm frequently brought in and there's a kind of, maybe the company at the beginning tried to use their internal communications team to manage a crisis. I will say in fairness to those practitioners, 
That's not why they were hired nine and a half times out of 10. They're hired for other act, for other things. They're hired because they're great marketers, because maybe they're great event planners. Maybe they have other kinds of you know, really important skill sets. But generally, organizations don't hire because they want a crisis manager um, you know, on staff. They don't need one because they're hoping never to have a crisis. And if they do, it's really infrequent. And so I think in the same way that you don't expect your general counsel necessarily to be your advisor in the midst of a class action lawsuit or you know, other kinds of litigation, uh, and you bring in outside legal counsel, that it is useful, uh, and I'm, I, I say that I guess it's a bit of a boost for me and my business, that you really want to bring in, in from a communications vantage point, also bring in people who are experts in this area. And I think it's wrong you know, for organizations to think that we'll use the people we use for normal business, operationally, or in a cybersecurity event. We haven't talked about that, but that's an area where you definitely want to bring experts in uh, or communications that you are in fact um, using experts um, as early as you identify the need to deal with these areas. Uh, and, I, and I think it stands most organizations in good stead. And if you've developed a relationship already, so I must say for almost, I think for all of the clients for whom I've done crisis planning work, I become an ongoing member of their team. I know them now, I know their plan, I know how they operate. And so it's very easy for me to join them when something goes, goes sideways. Okay, we've got three hands up here, uh, Logan, William and Casper in that order. So Logan. Hi, Dora. Uh, thank you, uh, Dora and thank you, Jane. Wow, that was a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I posted a comment in the chat section. It's the first entry, uh, Jane, which uh, okay. is my which is my question. I'm sorry, and I then, can't see it. But yeah, go ahead. Well, do you Can want you me to repeat read it? The, yeah, sure. So, um, right at the very beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the meat of the matter. So I said, speaking of the meat of the matter, the gold standard is the response of Maple Leaf Foods to their crisis a few years ago. Maybe I don't know how long. Ten years ago, it's all 2008. about reputation. Yeah, so it's all about reputation, right? Shouldn't we just watch that unfold and do the same thing? So that's the question. But just before you answer, um, uh, I thought your answer to Janice Riven's question was superb, like right on on the money. And then the other thing that I would say uh, before you get to my uh, question is uh, I. I really don't like to hear people as smart and articulate as you use that term alternative facts, even in quotes. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to give that kind of stuff credibility, right? You're absolutely right. And I do use it in quotes for sure. Um, yeah. there, there, there are not, you know, alternative, there are not alternative facts. Let me right just test to that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, you know, it, that's the, that is the, the problem that we have with social media platforms now is that everybody's got their version of events and holds to it. Um, so um, your question was... Um, say, Maple Leaf Foods. Maple, Maple Leaf, Leaf Foods. Foods, yes, of course. And I, I must say, I, uh, in a former, uh, at a former uh, firm, I did a lot of work with Maple Leaf Foods on their crisis preparedness. And I remember the date of the listeriosis break, um, uh, outbreak because uh, it was August 2008. And I know that because I joined Hill and Knowlton from another firm uh, that month. And that was, the, and my old firm was the firm that helped Maple Leaf Foods manage that, that outbreak. And I, you know, I think I left about a week before it happened. Uh, but I looked at it with enormous interest and there, was, there were a lot of elements that in 2008 were pretty extraordinary. The CEO doing a video, uh, you know, and not putting on a suit and tie and, you know, it was kind of a handheld camera uh, and Michael McCain looked pretty exhausted and was clearly speaking from the heart, which was so important. And we hadn't seen that before. Uh, so, you know, now it's pretty de rigueur. It's pretty, you know, that's is the kind of thing that is, is done a lot. Um, you know, accepting responsibility, settling quickly. Those were all really important guides. Uh, I don't, I think that, you know, 
13 years, uh, 2008, 13 years later, um, it, there are other things that have, that, you know, have, uh, uh, that we should learn from. So yes, it was an excellent case study and I'm sure, and I know the business schools are using it, uh, but there are other things uh, that organizations are doing now that I think you know are 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 equally important. Not not to in any way diminish uh, how 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 successful that was. The key reasons being the CEO was visible, was visible visible in a in a very genuine way, accepted responsibility quickly, uh, which as he says you know his lawyers did not counsel him to do. Um, but that was a bit of a you know saying that in itself was a bit of a you know nice PR moment. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then settling with the families, not drawing it out over a long period of time. Those are all good cues. There are other things though, that, that I think are, are important, you know, that we, we learn, we learn a lot over the intervening years and this, and the circumstances also change. So in 2008, he wasn't nearly as dogged by, you know, social media commentators, um, as would be the case today and would make that, you know, make that his, his response more difficult. Okay, William, thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, sorry, I, uh, uh, I need to save the bandwidth. That's why I, I don't turn on my camera. But anyways, thank you, uh, Jane, and thank you, Dora, for uh, the, uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, um, uh, if, I, if my understanding is correct, uh, today's discussion about crisis management is really about reput uh, saving reputation in at times of uh, uh, sudden uh, occurrence of difficulties. And uh, of course, there are uh, circumstantial ones where, for example, the, the climate crisis and et cetera, but there are also uh, self-made ones. Uh, you mentioned uh, um, the Rogers case. Uh, you mentioned Elon Musk. Uh, there was also, for example, let's say of the CEO of the uh, uh, Air Canada, who uttered something that brought on a political storm in, in our French speaking uh, uh, compatriots. So, of course, um, uh, nobody who climbed up to that high in the uh, corporate stratosphere has no, uh, has no ego at all. They all have huge egos and that's why they want to climb up there and show themselves. And uh, they always are sought out for sound bites. They also always wanted to speak and uh, social media has helped that amplify. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, of course, when things like these blow up, <laughs> they blow up spectacularly. So yes. uh, I'm kind of wondering what your advice would be for these people who want to be at that high and want to be seen and heard. And yet when they open their mouth, they may invariably uh, you know, st uh, stick their foot in their mouth, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, look for the amount of net times that CEOs are in public speaking um, uh, and have you know the, the actual incidents of things going spectacularly wrong are pretty few, in fact. Um, and most um, uh, public events that I that I'm aware of, where a CEO is giving a speech, where there's going to be a Q and A, where you're expecting a media scrum. Um, many, many CEOs will take a, a long time, you know, a good time to prepare um, and to be ready for the kinds of questions and their teams are responsible for making sure that they're considering and have thought through what are the things that could go wrong here. And I'm imagining that the Air Canada team probably considered the fact that, the, that their CEO was giving a speech in English only um, and probably you know, um, prepared uh, the CEO for some remarks. Now, the fact that the remarks he made, I'm guessing they're not the ones they suggested, uh, you know, were uh, in the moment, not the best ones. Uh, so it happens. As I said, I don't think it happens all that frequently. Uh, and when it does, there's no question it puts the company in a situation of really needing to respond quickly. Not, and I think it's important to recognize that it's not only to the media or social media, but in this instance, for instance, it's important to respond to your, uh, to your employees, to your internal audience, um, to have a response in this case um, for you know, the, um, the political actors who you know, got involved, the, the premier of the province and even the prime minister. 
um, to be able to speak, you know, to to have to be able to to um, to speak to that. And I think Air Canada did, you know, did an, a fine job after the fact um, in, you know, in apologizing and in saying that the CEO was going to redouble his efforts to to learn French and saying it, you know, admitting, and that's a big part of it, right? Admitting right out of the gate that the remarks were inappropriate, that the remarks did not reflect, you know, what he really feels and were inappropriate. So, you know, one these things happen. As I said, I don't think they happen as frequently as, you know, as um, uh, as, as you may or others may think. Um, and I think the, the important thing is to respond quickly. So don't, don't be silent because that vacuum will be filled by others and filled quickly. Uh, it'll be filled by people who are critics by and large. Um, and uh, so you wanna you know, be, be first out there as fast as you possibly can with what you have to say, which is, you know, this is not what we intended and here are the things we're doing to try to rectify that situation. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's as much as you can do. Um, and that's why I think it's really important to understand how you're going to do these things and who does what and in what role and, and, and as what responsibilities so that you can very, very quickly and you don't get bogged down uh, in many, many, many people having the opportunity to weigh in but knowing who are the few people who need to be involved, including, of course, the CEO himself, um, and getting out there really fast. Don't letting, don't let the thing simmer. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question, Gaspar. Uh, Gaspar, uh, you had your hand up, I think, at one point. Um, or if there's somebody else. Okay, well, if there is no one else, then thank you very much, Jane. Thank you for everyone who showed up today. I think uh, with, for those of us on boards, we can go back and check and see if we are prepared as we should be. And others who are in management or governance professionals can check up on their teams as well. So thanks, Jane, and um, have a good day, everyone. And I think, uh, Mike, you put up the next session so people can register for that as well.